Good evening, how's everybody doing? So welcome to our first Borough Board for 2020. Happy New Year to each and every one of you. Those of you who do not know me, I am Ingrid P. Lewis Martin. I am the, I almost said my old title, Deputy Brooklyn Borough President, and I welcome you on behalf of Borough President Eric L. Adams. To my left is our Director of External Affairs and my Executive Assistant, Sarana. So she will be assisting me tonight, and I welcome each and every one of you. I ask that when you make a statement, you please use the microphone. Uh, we have a colleague with us um, who I actually met tonight for the first time, Mr. Jibriel Jalo. 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 Yeah. Okay, he's from the Office of the Public Advocate, so he's here as a guest. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Thank you for joining with us. Of So while we're waiting to get quorum, which I'm sure we will achieve, it's the first one of the year, I welcome um, three presenters that we have tonight. The first presentation is by Revel to introduce Revel's electric moped ride sharing services. Then we'll have a second presentation by New York Care on the origins and eligibility and benefits of the New York Care program. And the last presentation will be by the Regional Plan Association, an overview and update on the Triborough Line proposal. So I'm going to ask our first presenter to please um, come up from Rebel. Our presenter is Mr. Paul Sui. Sui. Okay, and I see that you have someone with you, so please. Uh -huh. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for welcoming us here today. Uh, my name is Lauren Vereens. I'm the general manager for New York for Revel. And this is Paul Sui, who is our COO and co-founder of the company. Um, we're gonna walk you through a PowerPoint and then if we have time, we're we would welcome a couple of questions from the audience. Um, and so I'll let Paul kick it off. Good evening, everyone. Um, very excited to be here today. So just to give you an overview of what we want to accomplish, we really want to give you a one-on-one -on -one overview of Revel, so you understand who we are, what we're trying to accomplish, where we are in the company right now, really understand how the service works. It was also very important, I really wanted to come tonight, just to give you the story of the company, um, why the company exists in the first place, where we're trying to go in the future, and just give you a chance to really hear that story and make sure that you understand who we really are. So I'll, I'll start with the with the information piece of just what is Revel, and then I'll get a little bit into the general story. So starting with what is Revel, Revel is a way to get from A to B. It's a way to get from A to B that is safe, that is affordable, that is fully electric, that doesn't require getting in a car. So right now, we operate 1,000 electric mopeds in New York City, in Brooklyn and Queens. We also operate 400 mopeds, 400 electric mopeds in Washington, D.C., uh, 500 in Austin, Texas, and 750 in Miami. Uh, each Revel moped, and this is really important, is a street legal motor vehicle, meaning every Revel moped has a license plate, is registered at the DMV, it has full third-party liability insurance, it comes with two helmets for riders, it rides and parks in the street, it doesn't go on bike lanes, it doesn't go on sidewalks. It's a fully street legal vehicle. Um, one thing about Revel is the fact that we are a New York-based company. This company was born in New York for New Yorkers. Uh, I myself, I've been in New York for years. My co-founder, Frank, was born and raised in Staten Island. Uh, we were two guys with an idea. So getting into the story a little bit of where did Revel come from, we were really thinking the outer boroughs need more connectivity. <coughs> So the idea for Rebel was all trying to just give more access, give more options, more ways, more ways to get around. Um, so with that, if you look at the story, we started very small. We started in Williamsburg, Greenpoint, and Bushwick with a small pilot of 68 mopeds. We did that so we could learn as much as possible. We started with just five full-time employees. Uh, now we are close to 200 full-time employees, all based in New York, operating that fleet of 1,000 mopeds. And we've gotten to a place where, in New York City alone, our riders have taken over a million rides. So 
a little background on how the service works. So the key to the service is the app that you download on your phone. So to sign up for the service, you download the Revel app. It's a quick registration process of taking a picture of your driver's license and taking a selfie. So we run a background check on every user that signs up to understand their safe driving history. So if a user has a history of reckless speeding tickets or a history of driving while intoxicated, we screen those users out of the service. We also verify identities by ensuring that the selfie that you take when you sign up for Revel matches the picture on your driver's license. Then when you are approved for the service, you locate the nearest Revel to you by using that app. There's a map that shows you the location of each vehicle. You then use the app to unlock the vehicle, turn it on. So when you hit start ride, two things happen. You turn the whole thing on, and then the helmet case unlocks. So like I said earlier, there are two DOT safety approved helmets that come with every single ride. So as a company, we recognize from the get-go that transit is a shared public good. It's something that gets people very riled up because it's super important. It's important to your economic development. It's important to jobs. It's important to all of those things and how a city operates and runs. And so when we launched in June our, our bigger expansion, we decided to launch also our Revel Access program. And so that means that with every ride, um, if you are an individual who lives in the city who is in a public assistance program, you can apply to us to get a discounted um, part of the discounted service, which is 40% off each of your rides. So that means your rides could potentially be cheaper than a subway service, um, than a MetroCard ride, which is actually very, very affordable. Um, we've had our Revel users who are part of the Access program save over $60,000 to date using this program, and we're working really hard to expand it. Um, this map that you see kind of on the right-hand side, um, these are some of our trips over the summer, and you'll see actually that a lot of them are, are heading towards job centers. So as you know, in New York City, a lot of the subway routes are actually going from Brooklyn and Queens into Manhattan. But now we have a lot of job centers that are popping up in, you know, in Astoria, in Long Island City, in um, downtown Brooklyn. And so a lot of people are actually using Revel to get to job centers, and that's a really important part of our service. Another really important part of our company and how we like to operate and that's also part of why we're here today, is that we like to approach the community in which we want to operate and discuss the service with them before we're ever even operating there. It's really important that people know who we are because we're using the public right of way. And so you'll see some of these photos. These are us meeting with council members um, in the different areas in which we operate, as well as uh, police precincts. We've met with every police precinct in which we operate in. We've gone to every single community board. We've met with every council member. It's really important to us that the community knows who we are. Um, and we also come to events like this to make sure that we're accessible to you um, and your constituents if anyone has any questions or concerns. A uh, big part of that is that we have a group of employees. Um, we call them the Parking Patrol or Revel Rangers. Uh, they're actually out and about in the streets making sure that users are parking responsibly. Um, and they will move mopeds if they're in the way or blocking a garage. Um, we have a lot of community members that will reach out to our customer support, which is also located in Brooklyn, and say, hey, I need your help. This Revel is blocking my car for whatever reason. Um, can you help? And we'll get there within 30 to 45 minutes to fix it. Um, and we've developed a very strong relationship in a lot of communities in which we operate because of that responsiveness. We also are a local employer. So as Paul mentioned, we have about 200 employees here in New York. Um, and that's everyone from our engineers down to our service technicians and our field technicians. Um, we believe very strongly that we should not ever use the gig economy. It's just not the right thing to do. We want to pay our employees a living wage. We want them to have access to health care and benefits, the same health care and benefits that I and our CEO and COO have. And that's just how we've structured our business from the beginning. Um, and so we're really proud of that. We have one of our warehouses is in Red Hook right now. Um, and these are really, really good jobs because we're training people in electric vehicle technology. These are skills that they can use going forward in their career that are obviously going to increase over time. Safety is also very, very important to us. As I mentioned, it's the public right of way. This is a motor vehicle. Safety is really important. Um, each vehicle has a license plate, and that's really important to us because it ensures this level of accountability and responsibility. So there are also two helmets that come with every Revel, a smaller one and a bigger one. 
You can have a passenger, but you can also pick which helmet fits you the best. Um, these are DOT certified motorcycle helmets. Uh, we also offer lessons seven days a week out of our Gowanus headquarters. Um, and we also have our lesson specialists travel around to different neighborhoods on the weekends to provide additional lessons because a lot of times people don't want to go to Gowanus um, and we'll be expanding that next summer for sure. Um, the, yeah, I guess that's pretty much it. I'm going to pass it back to Paul to continue the lesson. So one thing I mentioned at the beginning is our goal to take car trips off the road. So if you look at the data of the past one million rides that we've had, the average trip distance in our current service area in New York is just about three miles. And if you look at what users tell us that they're using Revel instead of, about 65% are using Revel instead of a ride share. And then on top of that, around 20 to 25% of our trips are with two riders. So if you think about a three mile trip with two riders, that is replacing a car trip. So we're really excited about taking con congestion off the road. Even the current usage that we have in our service area, it's getting close to 10% of the trips that Uber sees on a daily basis. And we know that as we continue to grow, as we continue to expand and expand in the right way, we hope to continue to sort of eat into that market share and give people a way to get around that is not only super affordable, um, but just a lot of fun and it isn't adding additional cars onto the road. We were, when you launch a service like this, we, before we put a thousand mopeds on the road, and what we talked about is going to every single police precinct, going to every single community board, going to every single council member and having conversations up front early and often. But at the end of the day, you don't really know how it's going to go. What will the demand be? Um, we have a lot of estimates, we do a lot of user surveys, we look at a lot of data, but we were really, really happy with the level of demand that we've seen from the built-in community. Um, so much so that the rides per vehicle that we get is above and beyond what City Bike even sees. So it's just clear that we're filling this need. Um, and like I said at the beginning, we really created this company and started with the idea that a lot of the public transportation in this borough is geared to get you in and out of Manhattan. But if you want to go north-south, you want to go into Queens, you want to take a special trip, especially as even more jobs are created, that's a difficult trip to make. So it's great that we're able to sort of fill that need and give people an additional way to get around. Uh, one thing that we're just showing here that is really important to us is just the customer service that we have. We understand, like Lauren mentioned, of uh, being in the public right away, being a part of this community, we want to be responsive. So that's why we come to this meeting. That's why we have full-time customer service associates to make sure that we are responsive, that if there are concerns, there are questions, that we're doing our best to make sure that we give you the answers and we give you the answers in an appropriate amount of time. So you'll see just that commitment of anytime you interact with our company, we're responsive, we're quick, we really want to help. So on that note, uh, John and Carol are, are here from Revel as well. They're two of our community affairs managers. We um, obviously have our contact information here, but we can hand out our business cards. So we'd be more than happy to not only take questions now, but to have one-on-ones to come into your community boards and make sure that you're getting appropriate time with us. Um, we're not shy. We love to talk about Revel. We love to talk about your community. We you know, go into those conversations with eyes wide open and understanding that we always have something new to learn. So really appreciate the time here tonight and would be happy to, to answer any questions that you guys have. Okay, thank you. I'd like to take questions from the board members first. Richard, could you? <coughs> Richard Flateau, Community Board 3. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit about the parking regulations around Revel? Sure. So when a user ends their ride, they park perpendicular to the curb with their back tire closer to the curb. So the goal of our service is to take up dead space that already exists on the street. So not to take up another space where a car could fit. It's just park in a spot where another car couldn't go. When a user ends their ride, they confirm that they're legally parked for the next 24 hours. We also provide easily digestible information within the app that shows where good parking is, examples of good parking, information around signage, and then we have notifications in our operations platform of when street cleaning is to make sure that we're moving mopeds, and that's part of what Lauren said around street cleaning around Revel Rangers and making sure that we have full-time employees that are going around, making sure that mopeds are appropriately parked.
Good evening. Fred Baptiste, Community Board 9. Uh, just a quick question. I apologize if you already went over it. What's the safety record currently in terms of do we have statistics on accidents or, or you know, incidents revolving rebel riders? Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So to answer your question directly, 99.99% um, of our rides have happened without incident. There hasn't been any fatalities, any major um, knock on wood. But we also know that's not by accident. That's by a lot of the things that we do. So for us, safety really starts at the registration process, making sure that we're screening all new users, we're checking their driver's license, we're checking their safe driving history, uh, we're verifying their identity. We also self-impose a restriction where currently we require all users to be 21 years of age or older. We just think there's a certain level of maturity, a certain level of responsibility that we really want with anyone getting on our platform. And also, any new user, we provide free lessons seven days a week and making those really easily accessible and also not only allowing people to take lessons at our headquarters, but taking those lessons into the community. So we're really excited about the safety record, but we know it's not by accident and we have to continue to do that. Yep, so by going through the registration process, we provide all users with full third-party liability insurance. Hi, uh, Stephanie Sokowski, Ledge Director for Councilmember Brad Lander, um, the district where you guys have your HQ. Are there zones that, are, that you guys are not in right now? Are you all over in the five boroughs? Are you expanding? What's kind of, I, I saw the map very briefly, but what's kind of the geography that we're looking at? So right now we're in about 25 square miles within Brooklyn and Queens. Okay. So the service area covers from about Industry City up through uh, Queens into uh, Astoria. Um, so you, that's the area where you have to start and end your ride. Users are able to ride anywhere within the two boroughs of Brooklyn and Queens. They're able to pause the ride, but to end the ride, they have to come into those neighborhoods. Okay. Um, the goal for us has always been to serve the entirety of the outer boroughs. That's really our focus to begin here. Um, obviously, you have to take it one step at a time. You know, we started in three neighborhoods. Now we're in 25 square miles. The goal is to continue to expand that, but to do so in a really responsible way. Hi, uh, Janice Morgan, Community Board 16. Can you talk a little bit about the sanitation of the, um, or the, uh, the sanitizing of the helmets? Um, I've known some people who um, subscribe to the service and use the bikes, but they say, hey, I don't mess with the helmet because you know, other people are using it. So is there, you know, when your staff is moving around, are they also making sure that they're wiping down the helmets or um, are the folks who are riding the, the, the bikes responsible for wiping them down? What's the process? Yeah, that's a major function of our, our field technicians that we have on staff is that they visit mopeds, they swap out batteries, they're cleaning the helmets, they're, they're wiping down the mirrors, they're checking that everything is functional and all the mechanics of the bike are working. Um, but yes, 100% we're sanitizing those helmets. We also provide disposable hair nets in the helmet case and we encourage our users to use those as well. Um, we find that, of course, there are going to be some people that are a little bit squeamish about that, but if we find people who are not wearing helmets, we actually suspend them from our service because it's so important that you're wearing a helmet when you're riding a motor vehicle in the streets of New York. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15. Could you just go back to downloading the app and that's how you have access to the moped? Now, what did you say about selfies? Yeah, so that's part of the registration process. So the first thing you do is you download the app, and then you are asked to sign up. And so you put in your, your name, your credit card information, your address, that sort of thing. Um, but you're also taking a selfie so that we can verify that you are the person whose driver's license you have submitted. So that's what the selfie is about. And how does the money transact? It's through a credit card. So you have to use a credit card through the through app. Through the app. Yes, yeah. And then every time you use the app, credit card charge. Exactly. So the way that the payment works is it's $1 to start your ride, and then it's $0.25 cents a minute after that for, for, a, for a normal user, so not in the access program. A dollar to start the ride, $0.25 cents a minute after. Yes, yeah. So it, our users actually are surprised at how affordable it is, uh, particularly if you're going long distances. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's like a... It's pretty affordable. Camacho, CB4, uh, Bushwick. Uh, I don't know if it's a question, but um, I hope you don't take my car out the street. That's one thing I want to 
I want to tell you because cars also give insurance. We pay gas. We do repairs. We do a lot of things in regards. Also, I can't carry food for my kids in, a, in a, one of those, you know, mopeds. Mr. Camacho, my with point, all due respect, I, ask I, a question, I understand. I want, I want to be fair because they are in my community. Okay, ask so, a question. So, so, but you so have to they, ask uh, they a are in my They are in my community and also the unsafe of people riding up and down in regards, it's all fair to say that safety is the issue, but if there's no supervision and they're riding the wrong way and they're jumping up and down the curbs and then there's no supervision, then when something happens, then later on, we need to see them back at our board because we have a lot of issues and concern. You know, we can paint the picture the way we want to, but realistic, they're in my community, so I see. So we need to make sure that they're not fooling anyone in here or their, their data. I, I would like to see their data. I would like to see the police report. I would like to see what's going on to make sure that it is what they say it is. Because I could sit here and tell you my license is good, but when I give it to you, I have a hundred things that is wrong with it. But I just want to be fair to them and also not to be a smoking dream. That's all. There's no question to wake people up and let us know, yes, I'm going to be the devil's advocate. I will be the devil's advocate because I represent Bushwick. And that's what they brought me here for, to make sure that our community get the service and make sure that the data is worth. Or you're feeding all the community and not the new people that are coming into Bushwick. Would, just to answer that comment quickly, would be more than happy to come and have a follow-up conversation. And you have a lot of detailed questions. So. We will send you a letter. Sounds good. Do we have any other questions? Ed Powell, Community Board 14. Uh, how many employees do you currently have, and uh, do you anticipate, you know, growth in that area? So in New York City alone right now, we have close to 200 employees. Across the other markets that we have, we have close to 350 in total. Uh, in New York City, it all depends on our expansion efforts. So that's a combination of fundraising that we're able to take in, and making sure that we're wanted within the communities, but I'd see that uh, close to doubling, um, hopefully over the next two years. Are you, are you currently hiring people or bringing on uh, trainees? Are you training people? We are, and would love to connect afterwards to maybe discuss any employment partnerships or organizations that you would recommend reaching out to. We would be happy to have those conversations. Are there any other questions from borough board members? Members of the public, do we have any questions? Okay, so I thank you very much for your presentation. I wish you all the best. Thanks, everyone. Um, I'm happy to, to announce that we have quorum. So, Sarana, please um, call the roll. Starting with community board. Community board one. Communi community board two. Community board three. Yeah. Community board four. Yeah. Community board five. Community board six. Community board seven. Yeah. Community board eight. Community Board 9, Present. Community Board 10, Present. Community Board 11, yeah. Community Board 12, Community Board 13, Community Board 14, Here. Community Board 15, Here. Community Board 16, Present. Community Board 17, Community Board 18. Council Members, Council Member Barron, Council Member Carnegie, Council Member Cumbo, Councilmember Deutsch, Councilmember Espina, Councilmember Eugene, Councilmember Brennan, Councilmember Yeager, Councilmember Lander, Here. Councilmember Levine, Here. Levin, Councilmember Mizell, Councilmember Ample Samuel, Councilmember Machaca, Councilmember Reynoso, Councilmember Trigger, Councilmember Lewis. Here. Board President. President. At this time, I would like to adopt the minutes from the December 3rd meeting of 2019. That was our final meeting. Copies of the minutes were sent to all offices. Do we have any corrections? Okay, may I have a motion? In the mic, please. Teresa Scavo, Community Board 15, motion to approve minutes as printed. May I have a second, please? Could you please say that in the mic? He just gave Thank you one. Thank you. Ethel Tyus, CBA second uh, acceptance of the minutes. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, minute has been adopted. So our second presentation for this evening will be by, um, oh, okay, a representative from New York City Cares here tonight, and um, they will make a presentation. Marielle Crest is present. Good evening, everyone. Um, I just want to make a brief introduction. My name is Bridget Ingraham Roberts. I am the Assistant Vice President for Government and Community Relations at New York City Health and Hospitals. I'd just like to thank the Borough President and the Deputy Borough President for having us uh, this evening. Uh, we wanted to share with you some wonderful news about the NYC Care Program, which was launched uh, January of 2019. Um, NYC Care is a health access program. Uh, whereby we are aiming to provide uh, healthcare access to hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who currently don't have uh, health insurance or don't have access to healthcare. Uh, this is a major priority for the de Blasio administration um, and certainly for New York City Health and Hospitals. We launched NYC Care in the Bronx in August um, and have seen tremendous success. We've enrolled over 10,000 individuals in the program, uh, and we plan on expanding here to Brooklyn and Staten Island on January 30th. And so I have uh, Marielle Kress, who's the executive director of this wonderful program, um, and she will share with you an overview of the program, eligibility requirements, um, and to just share the good news with you. Thank you so much for having us. And I want to just interject. I know Bridget, very well, hard worker. Your name was scratched off because I thought you didn't want to be introduced because I definitely would have taken pleasure to introduce you. <laughs> thank Holly, you. for many years. Ingrid, so thank, thank you. you I appreciate that. Okay. okay. Hi, everyone. I second how wonderful Bridget is, and I she thank is. her for being here with me tonight. Um, and uh, she's available also to answer any general health and hospitals questions if anybody has those as well at the end of the presentation. Um, so my name is Marielle Kress. I'm the executive director of the NYC Care Program at New York City Health and Hospitals. I've been in the role for about nine months. Uh, previously, I was an advocate for children's health issues in DC. I worked uh, in the federal government implementing the Affordable Care Act for many years. Um, and I am a born and raised New Yorker, so it's wonderful to be home. Thank so welcome you for home. having me. Thank you. Um, so uh, I'd like to start with a statement of the problem. And the problem is that we have 600,000 people in this city alone who do not have health insurance. Uh, we estimate that approximately um, half of them are eligible for health insurance but aren't enrolled in it. And we're doing as much as we can um, in the uh, administration to connect people to health insurance. A lot of outreach, a lot of efforts, a lot of advertisement, um, and really encouraging people to sign up for the city's public, which is Metro Plus, that provides uh, many uh, services to patients that um, exceeds just what traditional health insurance is, helps people with supportive housing, helps people with other social determinants of health, like access to food and access to other things that um, impact people's health, but um, may not be uh, typical in a health insurance program. But we also estimate that about half of these folks, half of the 600,000, are ineligible for health insurance. Um, or cannot afford it based on the standards included in the ACA. And the reason why a lot of these folks are ineligible for health insurance is because of their immigration status. So people who are undocumented are ineligible to get affordable health insurance. They can't enroll in Medicaid, they can't get subsidies to enroll in marketplace plans, and they can't uh, enroll in the essential plan in New York. Um, and so uh, the de Blasio administration um, in uh, partnership with Health and Hospitals. Um, our CEO is 
uh, Dr. Mitch Katz, who has created health access programs in other cities. He created a health access program in LA. He created a health access program in San Francisco. Um, worked together to develop NYC Care, which really uh, is um, based on the foundation of the many years of providing care at health and hospitals to people regardless of their ability to pay and regardless of their immigration status. Um, so, like I said, uh, half of the 600,000 we think are eligible for insurance. We're helping them get connected to insurance. And I'm gonna talk about the other half of the folks who can't get health insurance and we want to enroll in NYC Care. I think when you talk about um, this population, this community, um, folks who are foreign born, who are coming to this country, I think, um, you know, we always try to start the conversation and enforce the fact that um, our values in providing care to New Yorkers um, is rooted in our commitment to equity. We want people to have access whether they have health insurance or they don't. Um, and that all of our services are provided confidentially um, and that we will keep patient records private and not turn them over to federal authorities. I think this is the most important thing that we can tell people um, in this particular political climate right now. I think a lot of folks are very nervous about seeking health care, seeking services, um, and we want to invite people in um, as the federal government is doing the opposite. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about what the program is. Like I said, it's sort of based on the long-standing commitment of New York City Health and Hospitals to provide care to anyone regardless of their immigration status or ability to pay. But we know that uh, more than 50% of our uninsured patients that we see across the system only come to us in the emergency department. And so that is really the crux of what this program is trying to overcome, to accomplish, to achieve. We want people to come to us in primary care before they're sick and to have that primary care provider be assigned to them to create a long-standing relationship with them and to connect them with specialty care, with behavioral health care, with prescription drugs, with dental services, all different kinds of things um, through that primary care relationship. So what we've done is we've enhanced and increased the access to primary care. Um, we're hiring new providers. Our existing providers are doing additional sessions on evenings and weekends to be able to meet the promise that we've put forth for ourselves of serving every new patient who comes to us through this program in primary care within the first two weeks of their enrollment. So we will promise an appointment for them within the first two weeks of enrollment in a facility um, in our system. And that's better than the national average. Um, so that's really what we're striving for. We want people to come to us in primary care and create those relationships. The second pillar of the program is access to prescription drugs. Um, we have had pharmacies in our facilities for a long time. They serve uninsured patients. Um, but their hours were not convenient for people. So someone might come to a doctor on Friday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and then go downstairs to get their prescriptions and the pharmacy would be closed at that point and then they would have to wait until Monday morning. So we're promising 24-hour access to pharmacy um, through extended hours uh, in our facility pharmacies. And then for patients who have really urgent needs overnight, we have um, contracts with 24-hour CVSs that patients can access by calling our call center, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, and get uh, medications overnight if it's very urgent. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how many prescriptions we filled just in those extended hours. In our uh, pharmacy at Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx, um, we have uh, that pharmacy open five days a week uh, until midnight, which is longer than many, many, many uh, retail pharmacies across the city. Um, and then the third pillar uh, is to create a better patient experience, a better customer service experience. So when you're uninsured, um, you probably rely on the emergency department because you don't have someone to help you navigate the system. And so that is what the 24-hour contact center is there for. A uh, patient can call, um, get connected to 
a financial counseling appointment to see if they might be eligible for insurance because we want people who are eligible for insurance to enroll in insurance. Um, and if they're not, enroll them in NYC Care, get them connected to a primary care provider who's assigned to them, and then get them that appointment within the, the first two weeks. So um, our call center is 24-7. We have um, English and Spanish and Arabic and Bengali speaking representatives, and then we have access to a language line 24 hours a day with 220 different languages available. Um, this is our membership card, another sort of facet of the membership experience that we want people to have. I think it's really important to note, NYC Care is not health insurance, but it seeks to create the same type of experience that somebody might have with health insurance. So on this card, it lists the person's primary care provider, that person's name. So when someone calls, they say, I want to make an appointment with this person, that's my primary care provider. And then one really important thing about the membership experience is that patients know their expected fees before they go to the doctor. So they don't have to worry that they're gonna get hit with a bill that they weren't expecting. Um, so our fees um, start at zero dollars. So if you're zero, if you make zero income, then you are paying zero dollars for a primary care visit. Um, and then that kind of goes up uh, along the income scale. Um, but is affordable up to 500% of the federal poverty level. Um, and I think one thing that we've really heard is that the membership, the feeling of belonging, um, the feeling of having a card that identifies that you are part of a program is incredibly meaningful for people. So as Bridget mentioned, we launched in the Bronx in August um, with uh, a lot of excitement. Uh, we. Uh, have enrolled uh, over 10,000 people in the first four months of the program. We set a goal for ourselves of 10,000 enrollees in the first six months of the program and proudly really blew it out of the water. So um, I'm very excited about that. Um, we'll be in Brooklyn and Staten Island in our facilities uh, starting on January 30th and then the remaining boroughs by the end of 2020. And what that means is that you know, patients can call and get that two-week appointment starting on January 30th in primary care. All of our pharmacy hours will be extended on that date and the call center will be live at that time. Um, I know many of you, most of you, all of you are familiar with the health and hospitals facilities in Brooklyn, but just wanted to make sure that folks um, saw the list, the extensive list. We also have Staten Island because we're going live as well in Staten Island on the same day um, on this list. And I think you know people have a lot of recognition of the large acute care hospitals in our system, um, Coney Island and Kings County and Woodhull, but um, one of the priorities of our CEO and our leadership is to really grow our community health center. So something that people might not know about health and hospitals is we have the largest federally qualified health center network in the country. Um, over 60 health centers um, across the city, um, and many in uh, communities in Brooklyn, Bedford, Brownsville, Bushwick, Crown Heights, Fort Greene, Greenpoint, and Williamsburg. Um, so we are gonna um, enhance capacity in all of those places, hiring new providers, hiring nurse practitioners, hiring nurses. Um, we also see this as a real jobs booster as well. So a little bit about eligibility, I think we mentioned previously, um, the person needs to be ineligible for health insurance or there's not an available plan that is less than 8% of their income. Um, and so the way that we uh, identify if somebody is ineligible for health insurance is that we help them go through the New York State of Health health insurance application. We wanna make sure that they get enrolled in insurance if they're eligible for it. Um, and we're hoping to reach a lot of people who might fall into that first 300,000 bucket um, through this process. Um, people must be a uh, New York City resident for more than six months. Um, we do accept self-attestation for this eligibility requirement, so we don't wanna make this a barrier for people. And um, currently, since we're only live in the Bronx, patients must live or want to seek care in the Bronx. And then on January 30th, that will be live or seek care in the Bronx, Brooklyn, or Staten Island. 
Um, so enrollment is, is easy. Um, patients should call the call center 24 hours a day, no wait times, uh, a fast process. Uh, the number is 646-NYC CARE. Uh, that's 646-692-2273. Um, the person on the other end of the phone will um, you know, ask a few questions, get that person an appointment with one of our financial counselors to do the insurance application, and on the same day, get that person an appointment with their assigned primary care provider. So we want people to not have to come back a number of times. We want them to be able to um, do everything in one day. Uh, patients can also walk into one of our facilities and meet with a financial counselor. There's kind of a rolling schedule um, and they will help uh, enroll that person in NYC care if they're eligible. So we, uh, we think that community-based organizations are um, critical to getting the message out about this program. Um, and so in the Bronx, we've contracted with five community-based organizations. Um, uh, they're listed here. Um, we will be announcing those uh, relationships uh, imminently in Brooklyn. Um, we had a really robust uh, request for proposals process um, and selected some incredible organizations that speak, I believe, over 10 or 15 different languages, are really um, geographically diverse, um, and are, are focused on the most vulnerable uh, populations who are ineligible for health. Um, in the Bronx, we had a very successful public awareness campaign. I think, uh, you know, part of this program is really welcoming and inviting people in to seek care um, at our hospitals and our clinics. And we are going to recreate this um, all across Brooklyn as well. So look for these uh, on the 30th. And uh, like Bridget said, we've been very successful in connecting people 100% of the time who are new patients to an appointment in primary care within two weeks. Um, we've enrolled over 10,000 New Yorkers just in the first four months of the program. And that's from every zip code in the Bronx. So even if there's not a, a health and hospitals facility around the corner, we, knew, we see that patients really see the value of this program and are coming from every corner of the Bronx and hope to replicate that in, in Brooklyn. And we have filled over 14,000 prescriptions just in those extended hours, just in this program alone. So um, that really tells me that there was an incredible need for patients who largely have chronic conditions, who have hypertension, who have diabetes, who cannot wait for their prescriptions. They need those extended hours, and we've been able to deliver on that with great success. Um, so, uh, some next steps. Uh, we have all of our materials in 13 different languages on our website, nyccare.nyc. I, I invite you and encourage you um, to be an ambassador for us, uh, for this program, and get the word out. We have lots of materials that we can share. We're happy to come. I think my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Jimenez, is a, a family physician. He wasn't able to be here tonight, but has contacted each and every community board to see if we can come to meetings and, and get the word out. Um, the, the number is here, it's on all of our materials as well. Um, and again, we're happy to come and, and talk to you and your constituents uh, more about the program. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any questions from borough board members? Please, Richard. Richard Flateau, Community Board 3. Uh, you mentioned that there is an RFP for um, CBOs to do outreach in Brooklyn. Could you tell us when you're going to be announcing the uh, winners of the RFP? Sure. Um, I believe we're planning to announce them next week, um, and we will give you certainly a heads up when we do that. Um, we're funding through the RFP uh, 20 full-time outreach workers at um, these community-based organizations. So their, their job um, for seven months is to um, come out and do outreach and try to connect people to this program. Um, it was extremely successful in the Bronx, and we just announced actually uh, an additional six-month extension um, of those contracts um, in the Bronx as well. Thank you. Hi, Janice Morgan, uh, CB16. Um, 
the health and hospital health centers are closed on the weekends, correct? Um, so in the Bronx, as far as I know, uh, we have Saturday hours. Okay. Uh, and um, I know that in our pharmacies there as well, we're open on Saturdays as well. Okay, because I know, um, I guess not all, I work for a federally qualified health center and I know not all of the H plus H health centers are open on the weekends. Mm -hmm. And so um, with trying to get people to access care, um, my question for you is, um, and stay out of the hospitals, um, my question for you is, how are you all planning to partner with the FQHCs to utilize their health centers for like weekend services mm -hmm. as opposed to landing in the emergency room? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think um, part of the answer to that question is that with this 24 hour call center that we have, um, patients can have access to the on-call provider and I think that was actually pretty difficult for people to navigate previously. They didn't have the phone number listed on a card in their wallet. Um, so we have 24-hour on-call provider access through the call center um, and um, we have express care sites across the city as well um, that are open on the weekends. Uh, but I think another issue that you bring up which is very important is our relationship to federally qualified health centers that are not within the health and hospital system. Um, and that is something that we've taken extremely seriously. As you know, um, our patients, uh, we, we have similar patient populations. You serve uninsured patients as well. Um, and the last thing that we want to do is take patients that you've created existing relationships in primary care with away from you to join this program. So. Um, we have reached out in the Bronx and done a number of meetings with federally qualified health center leadership. Um, we have one scheduled for Brooklyn FQHC leadership uh, in two weeks, I believe. And um, we have created a process at the call center when someone enrolls to say, do you have an existing relationship in primary care? Where is that existing relationship in primary care? And if someone has a relationship with an FQHC, it will actually list community provider on their card so that they're only coming to us for specialty care. And we've worked really closely with the FQHCs to get on to Epic CareLink. So we've, we're all on Epic now in our system. It's very exciting. Um, and Epic CareLink helps external providers refer to health and hospitals much more easily for specialty care. So we're hoping to really ease the process there um, through that. Thank you. For the Baptiste Community Board 9. Uh, first of all, I think this is a fantastic program in terms of, you know, it's just really, really needed. A uh, couple of questions. One, in terms of, I know that sometimes part of one of the barriers is if you try and get the help and you're waiting on the phone line for an extended period of time, some people just get frustrated. What's usually the average wait time in terms of, you know, people calling trying to find out or, and get enrolled? Um, so I get a report every single day about our uh, wait times. Um, I, I believe that we don't have a wait time. So if you call, um, you get right through. Uh, I think there might be sort of a, a little bit of a wait if you speak a language that's not available for a live rep and getting connected to the language line. Um, but uh, yeah, we monitor that every single day and so we have not had any issues so far to date with that. It's a good question. And, and the second question I have, so if, you, if uh, somebody calls with dependents, how, until what age are the dependents covered? Uh, so, so, sorry, the age uh, eligibility? Depends. Right, yeah. Um, so, so, in New York, uh, for children, we're lucky that uh, CHIP uh, is available to all children regardless of their immigration status. And so we want kids to enroll in CHIP in, in health insurance. Um, uh, we do know that there are people who don't even want to go through the insurance process. Um, and we encourage folks to come to us and talk to a financial counselor um, if they don't want to do that and, and there are mechanisms to be able to enroll in the program um, in those situations. But um, if you are ineligible for insurance, um, it doesn't matter what age you are, you can enroll in the program. Do we have any more questions from borough board members? Good evening, Glomani Bravo Lopez, Council Member Stephen Levin's office. Uh, I just wanted to ask what steps you're taking to engage with folks in uh, New York City shelter system. 
Um, so interestingly, uh, I think the statistic is over 80% of people experiencing homelessness are actually eligible for insurance. Um, so we are um, uh, reaching out to uh, the shelter system. We have uh, very regular uh, meetings with DHS and a lot of the shelter providers to ensure that patients are getting connected to insurance. Um, and then um, talking to them also about connecting to NYC CARE um, if they uh, encounter people who are ineligible for insurance. Um, I think something that is important um, is that uh, in the enrollment process, you know, we can send the enrollment materials to any uh, place that the person tells us. So if a, a person wants us to send the materials to a shelter or to even send it to the clinic for them to pick up if they're in a domestic violence situation, um, we can do that. So that's something that we've, we've done before. Um, but uh, I, I don't know, if Bridget, you want to talk a little bit more about our engagement with DHS and the shelter system? Um, yeah. yeah. No, Bridget, we can't, we can't hear you, so please. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Thank you for your question. Um, as Mariel said, this is a very vulnerable population, and um, we think that it is super important that we connect with them. Um, and if, it, in fact, 80% are eligible for insurance, we certainly want to tap into um, that, uh, that population. And so we will definitely uh, continue our co collaborations with uh, DHS uh, to make sure that we reach this uh, community. So thank you. Do we have any other questions from borough board members? Any question? Yes. I was wondering. No, please, your name and oh, your sorry. representation, please. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Marable from Lori Cumbo's office. And I was wondering about the siting of express care locations and you know their relation with these centers and let's say other existing hospitals, just to figure out like spread of access. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Uh, we have uh, launched um, several express care centers um, so far, I think about four of them uh, in Queens um, and in the Bronx, and there, is, there are plans to launch um, express care centers here in Brooklyn. Um, the specific dates are <clears throat> still being finalized and still being worked out, but we believe it will be in the first quarter of this year. So we'll have, definitely have more information for you. Um, and as soon as we have definitive dates, we'll definitely reach out and invite uh, the council member to those. Um, I have a question, Bridget. Do you know how many express cares are going to open up in Brooklyn and the areas where it will be opened? I can get back to you on that. Okay. okay. Do we have any more questions from the borough board or members of the public? Okay, so I want to thank Mar Marielle for your presentation. And Bridget, it's always a pleasure to see you. So thank, thank you, you for your very much. Appreciate it. Our pleasure. Thank you for your presentation. Um, our third agenda item my glasses on, is the presentation of the Regional Plan Association. And they're here tonight, and they will take questions from you. We have two representatives, Marlon Meta. Did I say your name properly? Yes. And Vanessa Bar Barrios. OK. Hello. So please. Hello everyone and happy new year. Uh, thank you to the Brooklyn Borough President's Office. Um, thank you for your time, all community board representatives and council member representatives. Uh, my name is Vanessa Barrios. I'm joined by Molly Mehta, my colleague. We are both senior associates for state programs and advocacy at the Regional Plan Association. So, the RPA is an independent nonprofit organization whose mission is to research issues of regional and statewide of importance, as well as to improve the region's economic health, environmental sustainability, and quality of life. Our RPA staff, as you can see here, are made up of planners, architects, engineers, and advocates who come from a variety of backgrounds who work hard every day to help our region prosper. RPA operates in three different states, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York, and we encompass the entirety of the New York City metropolitan area. 
Our region includes 31 counties, over 780 municipalities, and encompasses over 23 million people with a $1.3 trillion economy. We see it as our role as to push for implementation of projects and initiatives across political boundaries that will lead to positive change. So for over almost over 100 years, uh, we have been using and preparing regional plans uh, for the tri-state metropolitan area. And these are once in a generation plans that we are, or what we are most known for. Some of the things that we have advocated for in the first plan was the location of the George Washington Bridge. In the second plan, we advocated for the creation of the Second Avenue subway. And in the third plan, we advocated for congestion pricing. Um, as you can see, that some of the things we advocate for take a long time to implement. Um, our most recent plan was released in November of 2017. And while we do do planning for mostly long term, we use our strings every day in planning, research, and advocacy for the interests of our region um, and to promote the implementation of a range of projects, programs, and policies. So like I said, we just released the fourth regional plan. Um, our research and engagement helped establish a vision for what we wanted our region to look like. And ultimately, we saw that these four foundational values were equitable, equi equitability, health, prosperity, and sustainability for everybody in the region who calls this region home. These values were used to develop recommendations across these four action areas to fix the institutions that are failing us, to rise to the challenge of climate change, to make the region affordable for everyone, and to create a dynamic, customer-oriented transportation system. So, like I said, our work has identified many challenges in our region, from increasing eff effects of climate change to a growing crisis of affordability in housing. However, today we are going to focus on transportation and how that affects every aspect of our lives. So transportation is the background, backbone of the region's economy. The quality and dependability of our transportation system directly correlates to our quality of life and for everybody who lives and works in our region. Many of the improvements to our transportation system can be very quick and inexpensive at the neighborhood scale. But the region needs to be think uh, and get behind bigger projects that have far-reaching effects on land use settlement patterns, the economy, and the environment. We have not been investing in our infrastructure in the way we should have been addressing the challenges uh, caused by new economic development and population growth. This short-sighted planning has fueled our existing challenges. And I'm sure none of these facts are shockers that 43% of outer borough residents aren't within reasonable walking distance to subway stations. And when you take into account how many of the subway stations are accessible to differently abled New Yorkers, that number decreases significantly. Also take into account that over 50% of job growth over the past 15 years has been outside of Manhattan, and that outer borough residents have long circuitous routes, commutes that are only getting longer. And for some outer borough communities, they're seeing almost, they're approaching over an hour commutes outside of Manhattan. But progress has been made, uh, especially on the bus side. MTA is in the midst of a bus redesign that you may have been involved in, in the Bronx, in, in Staten Island, and in process for Queens and Brooklyn. Our mayor recently announced that we have a butter bus action plan, which is going to push for better improvements that complement congestion pricing, that will make transit trips in and out of the congestion zone faster and more reliable. Corey Johnson's Master Streets Plan would require DOT to install bike lanes as well as press priority lanes um, through, the, through to 2024. 
And you know, some of the, these street interventions have seen immediate results. Uh, the M14 bus line that has once been the most dubiously recognized bus line of being the slowest in all the five boroughs has recently, recently seen a transformation where we have banned due to and DOT collaboration as well as the work for many transit advocates. They have successfully bland, banned uh, vehicle traffic on 14th Street and since its implementation in October we've seen a 40% decrease in commute times on that busway. So with some of these wins in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Malin, who will talk a little bit more in depth about how the creation of passenger service on existing freight rail can drastically improve outer borough transit for all. Thanks, Vanessa, and, and good evening to all of you. Um, as, as my colleague pointed out, we have a lot of plans and funding committed to our existing transit system. Unfortunately, that system was built to get people in and out of Manhattan. Um, and improving it is not going to necessarily benefit out of borough residents who need to get elsewhere. Um, and, and as other challenges that are facing the city, um, such as affordable housing, continue to displace low-income residents, we're adding further and further strain on uh, New Yorkers that are already having difficulty getting by. That's why we wanted to talk to you today about the Triborough, which we think gives us an opportunity to look beyond the existing system and think about the next generation of transformational infrastructure needed to keep our city growing. So I, there were some uh, handouts that we had at the front, so because I know this is probably hard to read. Um, but the Triborough is a 24-mile line that extends from Co-op City in the Bronx, through Queens, and down to Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. It would use an existing rail right-of-way to create a perpendicular connection to you know, the spokes, if you will, of our subway system by intersecting with 17 subway lines, four commuter rail lines, and dozens of bus lines. By our conservative estimates, it would serve about 100,000 daily riders, shorten trips between and within boroughs, and it would provide resiliency and cr by creating some redundancy in our transit system. The Triborough can be part of the solution to improve connections in the outer boroughs and the quality of your life to improve access to jobs, opportunities for affordable housing, and to improve public health by helping to reduce road congestion. So giving more people more time for work, family, and friends is a critical driving force of our advocacy on this line. And through our research, we've been able to generate um, a few maps that highlight some of the time savings that we think would be realized if the if the line was implemented. Um, again, this might be hard to see, but we have, we have this on our website. But basically what this map is showing is for people that are commuting to and from Brooklyn College, um, the darker areas show places where they would save over 30 minutes per trip because of the Triborough line. Um, and, and as you can see, you know, for example, Jackson Heights, instead of having to travel on the 7 or whatever into Manhattan and back, at, back down into Brooklyn, you can get on the Triborough line and save a lot of money going to Brooklyn College. So the Triborough will connect many neighborhoods that currently have limited transit access along its north-south corridor. Something that we think is a big advantage of this proposal is the fact that the line already exists and already has some of the infrastructure in place. Currently, it's underutilized with limited freight and passenger service, which is why we think introducing regular passenger service along the line is worthwhile. And some of you may already be acquainted uh, with seeing this line in your own districts. We all know that new transit projects can be expensive. But having this existing infrastructure in place could reduce construction costs and the timeline for getting it done. Our initial estimates have pegged the capital cost for this line at one to two billion dollars. That said, one of the challenges we see is in the contracting and ownership structure that is currently in place. As you can hopefully see on this map, uh, the Long Island Railroad controls the line from Bay Ridge up to Fresh Pond in Queens. CXS runs this Fremont Secondary Line up to uh, Astoria. And uh, Metro North New Haven line runs over the Hellgate Bridge through the Bronx and up to New Rochelle. And these next two slides just give you a sense of what the existing uh, infrastructure is like in places along the line. And I'm happy to share any of this afterwards so you get a better sense. 
So one of the most important things we're going to be looking at um, is how freight and passenger service can share the tracks. As our region continues to grow, we know that freight capacity will need to improve along the line. And it's important for getting trucks off the road to reduce emissions. We don't really see this as a, as a if or uh, situation. The Long Island Railroad is already running freight and passenger service along its line into uh, Long Island. Um, and several other cities have, have seen success. For example, in Chicago, one of the central areas for freight in our country, they have 80, frames, 80 freight trains and 120 passenger trains running on the same track each day. London, we see that there's a larger system consi consisting of over 80 stations covering 53 miles. Um, they use a similar approach on reusing existing infrastructure. Uh, with their program, they've been able to serve half a million riders each day. Uh, and 30% of all Londoners are now within a uh, 15 minute walk to the station. And the communities along the line also improved access to better housing and to uh, better local economies. So th the good news is the MTA has committed to evaluate a part of the Triborough line. Uh, and we hope we'll be issuing a scope of work soon to study the portion that runs from Bray Ridge up through Astoria. Uh, typically, a scope of work like this would cover things like what are the needs in the surrounding communities? What are the type of rail cars and engineering needs required? Um, what's the frequency of service that would be feasible along the line, how it could integrate with the existing transit network, and what the cost and scheduling would be to get it up and running. Um, I just want to take a moment to, to recognize everyone that has supported this project along the way. Uh, we're grateful to leaders like Borough President Adams, the Brooklyn Chamber of Commerce, Com Council Member uh, Reynoso and Assemblywoman Latrice Walker, um, and many other elected officials and advocates that have spoke up about the need for better transit to connect poorly served areas outside of Manhattan. It's with all of their support that we were able to get the MTA to commit to this study back in uh, September uh, of last year. And you know, the feasibility study is a really great first step, uh, but we know it's not, not the whole thing. And um, you know, we're gonna be continuing our conversations to advocate for this project and inform the public um, over the year. Uh, and we'd love for you all to consider supporting uh, the project and we're happy to meet um, with your boards to discuss it further. Um, and, you know, coming to the borough board meeting, we're also here to, you know, ask you to consider supporting a borough board resolution supporting the project so that we can let the MTA know, MTA know that, you know, this is a serious expansion project that they should um, continue to look at. So with that, we're happy to take questions. Okay, so do we have any questions from the borough board members? This is the first. Do we have any questions? Okay, thank you. It's not a first. <laughs> Hello, sorry. Um, please Corey announce Willis. your name. <laughs> yes, please. Community Board 10. Um, so because the, uh, it appears that at least the terminus of one, of the, of the one end of the line um, would be within our board or, or right at, at the end of it, um, I'm wondering what type of facilities um, are you envisioning having at the end of this line at 65th Street? So that's something that we are hoping the MTA puts into their scope of work um, because it would be the terminus, but there, if you look at our proposal, there, was a, there is a long-term vision to extend it into Staten Island through tunneling, but that, that would cost a ton of money that we know is not currently in anybody's uh, mind, mindset. Go ahead. And ultimately, we know as planners that if we are going to say what it's going to look like, it's not what it's going to be looking like. And from our experience and working with the fourth plan, it's so important to you know, engage with the community and understanding what their specific needs are. So once we get to that point, I envision that there would be a very robust engagement process. Um, but ultimately, it would have to serve the needs of the community. Well, well my um, question was really, um, and I, maybe I, I, I actually was not clear. My question was really more with regard to the freight end of it. Um, you know, with regard to moving people, most of us can envision what that looks like. Um, but with regard to the freight uh, movement that you're contemplating, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have any ideas on that. Um, it may be too um, preliminary for that, but I'm just curious if you have any concepts of that now. It is definitely, we are in the preliminary process of it, but um, I imagine that we were, will definitely take note of how the commingling process was taken into consideration both in London as well as in Chicago, and we will definitely use lessons learned from there in order for us to make sure that both of these two uses will work in harmony. 
in the end. And I just want to add, there is like there is limited freight uh, trains running right now on the line. About I think the last estimate was about two to three a day. So there is a lot of capacity on the line to actually uh, increase the, the amount of freight traffic that's on it. Um, and, and so we're looking to see how the frequency of passenger service would, would be able to co-mingle and whether that frequency of service to serve passengers would, would be able to mesh with the expected increase in freight over the coming, coming years. Yes. Hi, Janice Morgan, Community Board 16. Um, so I, I guess my first question would be, how do we stay connected to this work? I mean, it was, it's a lot of information for me to take in tonight, which is why I have a million questions, but um, I can't ask them all tonight. Um, and then the next question would be, so this tri-borough, um, it won't be, re you don't anticipate it being regulated by the MTA, this would be like a private subway line that would um, connect to the MTA's transit system. I guess that's kind of the overarching thing that I don't quite understand. So, so part of the feasibility study that the MTA will undertake would be looking at that, like what, what makes more sense from a, finance, from a capital construction perspective, from an operational perspective, on whether they should be the ones operating and maintaining it or whether it should be a third party. Um, ideally, it would integrate with their existing system and be run by the MTA so things run smoothly. Um, but there are, uh, like in, in New Jersey, the Hudson Bergen light rail was, con was constructed through a third party um, endeavor and that, you know, that has functioned well. So, so there are options out there. We're just, you know, we're, we're, we're waiting right now kind of to see the scope of work from the MTA and we're hoping to see that soon. Okay. And, and, and we're happy to give you our business cards. Feel free to get in touch. If you want us to come and speak to your board, we're happy to do that too. Mm -hmm. But how do you um, stay connected to, I guess, the movement? that's happened, because I hadn't heard of this prior to tonight, because you all haven't been to, to my knowledge, you haven't been to my board. Um, no, yeah, yeah uh, this is right. kind of, this year is when we're kicking off okay. kind of the community. But um, you can invite them in, yeah. and yeah. you can have his card and surround and connect I just want to be able to go someplace and be able to follow, I guess, if there's updates that are posted, et cetera. So you can definitely follow us on social media, go to our website. Uh, we, have a, we have a web page dedicated to this, this project. We're in the middle of a redesign, so there'll be some changes that'll come, but that'll show, that should hopefully keep things more updated. Um, and you know, anytime we talk about it or email out about it, if you join our mailing list, you'll, you'll be aware of it. Okay, any thank you. And we can invite them back if you have any real interest in it. I'm afraid you had a question. Uh, very quickly. Uh, so you said the MTA is currently in the process of a feasibility study? Yes. Do we have an idea in terms of how long it'll take before they actually come back with the results of that study? Hopefully soon, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, we do know that we that it's included. Not it's not included in. They have the feasibility study, but we don't. We, they haven't given us a quote on when it's going to be completed, and I don't expect for us for them to tell us exactly when. So, sorry, just to clarify. So they 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 originally told us that it was they were going to try and release an RFP at the end of last year, um, and then towards the end of the year, I guess, you know, things happen. Um, so, but we are hoping to see what that scope of work is um, and what the time frame is on that, hopefully sometime this month. Um, just to circle back to um, CB10, um, I think the issue with freight might be the contents of the freight. I don't think that it would be anything that's harmful to the environment or to people that's utilizing the service. And it would have to be contained, I'm sure. Well, it wasn't really, really um, so much with regard to the content. I am aware of the current um, railroad structure that's there, and it is really only about three cars a day. It's, it's ancient, and it's not utilized very much. But the concern um, really, um, we, I, we, are, we are aware um, you know, of your project. I think there's been some talk about it in the past. Um, really is the volume. And what kind of volume of, you know, you, you're, if you're moving things by freight, they have to get to the beginning of the line. That brings a lot of traffic, a lot of congestion um, into our district. Um, and um, most of the time, with the current facilities, um, you know, maybe a connection to Stat with Staten Island notwithstanding, it's by truck. So that is a great impact 
um, on our community and upon you know our traffic, our transportation, our congestion, um, our new bike lanes, you know everything. So um, there, there we we will we're very interested in this project because we feel that there will be a great impact um, on our community from it, and that's why I was wondering about really the scope of the freight moving people. We're so happy about um, <laughs> you know because we do have a very limited rail service. We only have the R train. Um, and the buses which are currently being revamped, but uh, that we're very, very interested in hearing about really what you are contemplating. Um, and we'd be very interested to hear about what the MTA comes back with in terms of the scope of work, um, you know, and any feasibility studies, you know, any results of any feasibility studies would be highly interested in that. Yeah, I mean, some of the pushback in the past against this proposal has been the need to increase freight and so any, anything else you do besides freight is, is bad for, for that kind of expansion. And I think, you know, introducing passenger service along the line allows the communities around it to have a certain say in, like, what else is done. So, you know, if the MTA or if, if the federal government is willing to invest in passenger service, you know, what, what's that kind of trade-off that gets put in place? And I think that we would want to see a robust community engagement process to understand what are those impacts and how we can reduce some of the, some of the negative outcomes that, you know, okay. growth will inevitably create. If, if I may, one quick question. Um, and uh, excuse my ignorance, um, but you're a, you're a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. Um, so I'm just curious as to, um, so what was the impetus for this on your end in bringing it about in the first place? Obviously, we all need more transportation, but I'm just curious about this line in, in particular. I actually don't know exactly the answer to that. However, I think just in general with the Regional Plan Association, because we are planners, because we are advocates, we're very, we're policy nerds, we're very much wonky. I think, I believe from what I remember that in the third plan this was something that was proposed, that this was something that we have also, we've been thinking about. Um, our transportation um, department was very robust, and I think they identified specific areas, uh, specific rail areas, rail lines that were underutilized, and understood that these are places of, these are places of opportunity to really improve service to, play, to to folks who generally don't generally either have to walk more than half a mile, maybe even a mile to to actual rail service. So. We saw it as, a, as an opportunity, and essentially in the past three years, two years, we've been kind of running with it, so. Okay. CB7? Uh, never mind. Okay, Thank so you. we have a guest who has a question. Please take the microphone. Yeah, no, I, I, I hope you clearly seen back there. Oh. Um, my name is Curly and Johnson, and uh, I'm just, a, um, you know, a, a citizen, you know, Brooklyn. Um, it sounds very ambitious, your undertaking. And you made a reference to the Second Avenue line, which yeah. took a long time for them to do. Um, I think that it's a good thing because, as I read in the, pat, the, the handout, that you are connecting service in an area like Maspeth and Fresh Pond that uh, after the war, they had no subway service. No subways run into Maspeth and that area of Fresh Pond Road. So how are you um, financing this undertaking? Or I'm sure people will buy into it because at this point, there isn't any subway. Uh, if you're working, and also these are, um, industrial areas where there's a lot of congestion, a lot of traffic, a lot of um, cars because people have relied on their own transportation to get about. But there are many, many factories and I can make the connection between Chicago and even Kansas, which has a viable um, a line for moving uh, goods and stuff. But I'm not exactly clear, and I don't get the whole picture uh, very simply of what your undertaking will be and 
where's the financing coming from? Because Second Avenue took a long time. Okay. And how the MTA will work into that. Thank you. Just no answer. Clear, clear. So I mean, just so just to be clear, we're, we're, we as as a nonprofit, we're not trying to finance this infrastructure, but we are. You know, part of one of the big this this MTA study that we reference is actually a really big milestone because we've been we've been researching this idea. And just to go back to your question, um, you know, we I, I think the the motto is always if there's a rail right if there's a right of way, keep it. And our our transportation department it, during the third plan was actively thinking on ways on how the city could prosper and grow and in, invest in its infrastructure to connect the outer boroughs because there was an there was an understanding back then that this Manhattan-centric model is not going to really sustain the city in the long run. Um, but I think this milestone with the feasibility study is, is critical because, you know, while, while our transportation department did an initial study that it would cost one to two billion dollars, you know, I, I don't know if anyone saw the recent release of the, uh, the Rockaway Branch study that showed it would be, what, upwards of eight, nine billion dollars to reactivate that line. And there's a lot of other work that would need to be done because of that. So we want to see, like, has our research that we've done in the past, does that mesh with reality today when you have an engineering firm looking at this and, and calculating all the construction and labor costs? And if it falls within that one to two billion dollars, you know, looking at the amount of residents in the city that would benefit from it, it's really, then it comes to an advocacy standpoint of how do you get the MTA to include in its capital plan? How do you, how do you get, if needed, the federal government to pony up some money because we know that it's important to connect the outer boroughs. So, you know, those are the things we're looking for, and that's why we want to continue the public education aspect of this project as we wait for the study to come out, um, hopefully, sometime this year. Okay, do, okay, so I want to thank you both for your presentation this evening. It was very enlightening. As you mentioned, the borough president and a number of council members do support the project because there is a clear need for a transportation line and in those specific areas. And since the infrastructure is there, it would defray the cost tremendously. So we wish you every success Thank with your endeavors. And if we can be of any assistance, please let us know. Okay. So I thank you. Um, so that concludes our business portion um, this evening. Is there any unfinished business that anyone would like to discuss? Any new business? Well, I have something I'd like to discuss. Um, if you notice recently, there's been an uptake in hate crimes, and specifically in Brooklyn. And um, the borough president has come up with what I think to be a tremendous idea, which he is calling breaking bread, where his concept is for 10 individuals, one is a host and nine other people, all from different ethnic backgrounds, get together and they literally break bread and have a conversation. Um, we will have a member who's an MSW present who will help to facilitate the initiative. So I'm putting that out there to you. And if you have any interest, you let us know and we'll send you a link so you can find out more information about it. But I think it's a tremendous idea. I'm going to definitely participate in it and um, see what we can do to help change some of the negative energy that's been brought into our society. We, there are a number of reasons why. I don't want to point any fingers or make any accusations, but there are a number of reasons why. But we as Brooklyners and New Yorkers, we need to find a better way. So I just put that out there to you. So Serrano, as a matter of fact, will email you that information and you can give it a look-see if you have any interest in it. Okay? So, yes, so Teresa. It has to be 10 people? Well, we want, to do, we want to keep it where it's containable. You don't want to do a meeting with like 20 or 30 people. Oh, so you're doing it? I thought you were talking me at my You home. would do it. It doesn't have to be your house. It could be, you could say you want to do it here. You may want to do it in a restaurant or wherever. And it shouldn't cost a lot of money. Um, one of our um, colleagues, Alma Jamal, came up with... Um, a piece to it where she said people should actually the host should really talk to the different people who are coming in advance to find out what is their bread of choice. And if you like matzo bread or crackers, whatever, I like cornbread or somebody likes challah or whatever, and you all bring bread and you share it and have a conversation. Some people may want to have a dinner, but we don't want it to be something where if you don't have the means or the finances, you can't do it. 
and the borough president is willing to contribute some low dollar amount to help with it. And we think it's a tremendous idea. Um, I really like it, especially for young people, because I think the young people would benefit extremely greatly from it. So, you know, I'm hopeful that you will look at it, you will give it thought, and that you may actually be a host or a participant. All right, so. I think this is the time where we're going to make a motion. Motion to a Teresa Scavo, CB15, motion to adjourn. She's our motion to adjourn and motion <laughs> all the time. Julio Pena, CB7, second. Thank you very much. So all those in favor of adjourning the meeting? Aye. Any Aye. opposition? Aye. Any abstentions? Aye. All right, so have a safe journey home. Thank you all. Thank all of our guests tonight for coming. Aye.